I'm Dan Morgan, the Vice Chair of Biomedical Sciences at Marshall University and a representative of the West Virginia INBRE. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everybody back for day two of our symposium on substance use research uh, and also take a moment to thank our speakers and panelists from yesterday again. Uh, so on the schedule uh, for today, uh, we'll start with a keynote lecture uh, from Dr. Colleen Hanlon in just a few minutes. Uh, following a, a brief uh, morning break, uh, we'll have a virtual poster session. Uh, and then again, after lunch, um, we'll come back and have a community engaged research talk uh, by Dr. John Zosky and Michelle McKenzie. Without any more delay, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen Hanlon, our keynote speaker for today. Uh, so Dr. Hanlon is a professor in the Department of Cancer Biology at the Wake Forest School of Medicine, where she leads a clinical neuromodulation laboratory uh, devoted to understanding the effects of transcranial magnetic stimulation and evidence-based brain stimulation for treating substance abuse and pain. Uh, she's published more than 80 papers, um, at least that's what I could come up with on PubMed, uh, and is supported by multiple NIH R01 grants. Uh, she's trained more than 50 medical, graduate, postdoctoral, and fellowship students, and is active in the leadership of multiple professional societies, uh, including the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, and the Soci Society for Neuroscience. Uh, so in addition, uh, Dr. Hanlon has been an ad hoc member of more than 20 NIH study sections and is currently a permanent member of the Neural Basis of Psychopathology, Addictions, and Sleep Disorders uh, study section. Uh, so we're going to hold questions uh, until the end of Dr. Hanlon's uh, keynote lecture, uh, and then individuals can ask those questions using the chat function in Zoom. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to welcome and turn the floor over to Dr. Hanlon. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And um, I mean, I'm sorry for coming to my talk and for inviting me to your symposia. Um, I love, I, I, I'm looking forward to learning more about um, what you all are doing there. I, I think it's so wonderful that you're focused on rural health. Um, so often we all live, we work, many of us work in these ivory towers and cities. Um, but in fact, as you all know, probably better than I do, addiction is, you know, doesn't discriminate based on urban and rural environments or um, socioeconomic status, skin color, all of that. So um, it's a huge need actually to think about therapeutics um, that not only apply to the populations that typically come into our research studies in a big academic medical center, but can be scalable to people out in the community. So today what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, um, is a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, and you may have heard of this before, um, but I'll teach you a little about it in case you haven't heard about it. And I'm going to um, speak to you a little bit about how um, our group and many other groups across the world actually are really pushing the use of this tool forward in addiction medicine. Um, and so um, the talk will kind of be three parts. One is sort of our conceptual model for how to think about designing a smart brain stimulation based therapeutic for addiction. The second is really exciting news that um, in 2020, maybe the best thing that happened in 2020, um, TMS um, was cleared for use in smoking cessation. This is a very particular type of TMS um, and um, it shows good, um, good efficacy, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And then finally, I'll end with some of the work that we're doing and our colleagues are doing, um, trying to push the field forward a little. The one thing I like to start with, um, which I hope you all appreciate as well as clinicians and practitioners, um, you know, addiction is stigmatized, obviously, right? Um, but in fact, I like to describe it as actually something that's just fundamental about the human experience. Um, and in this case, um, I like to describe what I study as the push and pull between limbic drive and arousal, um, those circuits that make you like, crave and drive and do passionate things. And then the brain circuits or the behavioral processes, they're involved in cognitive control and planning and sort of more rational thinking. Um, and we know these things are so important. These two behavioral processes are so fundamental to the human experience 
that are some of our oldest stories in Western civilization and likely Eastern civ um, are based on this push and pull of reason and emotion. Descartes wrote about it, Plato wrote about it. Here's an example on the screen of a painting of the Temptation of Adam, like one of the first books in one of the books that are most widely read around the world. Um, and in many of you probably know this story, of course. Um, and the story goes that we have, um, we have Adam sitting here in the Garden of Eden and he's promised an eternal life um, a long life of happiness and fulfillment, as long as he does not take a bite of the apple from his tree. And so then here Adam is just going about his normal life and this tempting stimulus comes up to him. And it's this beautiful red luscious apple um, and it's presented to him by this beautiful naked woman. And it's presented and Adam has to make a choice. Um, and we kind of know how that goes, right? Um, and so Adam presumably bites into the apple um, and he takes his immediate gratifying reward rather than a longer term goal. And so again, um, but that's not, these are not just old stories, of course. Um, these are present in our normal everyday lives right now. So if you drove to work today, for example, or if you're going to um, drive somewhere this weekend, you may um, be in this sort of very modern situation we all have where we have electronic devices all around us um, trying to pull our attention away from driving, whether it's your cell phone sitting on your passenger seat or your child um, and his or her device on the passenger seat or your Apple Watch on your wrist that's telling you random news flashes that you honestly we really don't need to know. We have this weird drive to look at them. Um, but in fact, we know we're supposed to keep our eyes on the road. This plays out with eating, of course. Um, this is just an example of a sign that was in New York City. Um, you walk down the road and you have Dunkin' Donuts, these beautiful smelling donuts everywhere. You think to yourself, oh, God, that would be so good. I know I just ate breakfast, but man, I just like a donut. It smells amazing. Um, and then they tell you right in front of your face how many calories it will cost you. Um, and of course, drinking is probably one of the most like socially um, endorsed forms of um, drug consumption. Um, many of us have been in social situations, probably especially when we were younger, where a lot of people are around and drinking socially. It's getting late. Some people are starting to go home. And then someone in the bar says, oh, come on, one more round. Um, and you might think to yourself, oh, I should really stay. I would say so good and it would be free and I would be popular. Um, that's one circuit in your brain. But then hopefully more often than not, you also think, oh, but you know, I need to drive home. That's not smart. I have a test in the morning. My significant other will be angry. And so you have this push and pull of these behavioral processes. Modern, like I think currently we all um, feel a little bit about this with masks. Um, it's much nicer to not wear a mask, of course, um, it's, and it's much just more fun. Of, um, but on the other hand, we probably should be wearing masks more than we are. So this is another side of push and pull between emotional drive and arousal and cognitive control. Uh, hi, Carmen. Yes? This is Dan. Yes. So we can see your screen, but it's not in presentation mode. Oh. Okay, you can't see their presentation mode view? I can't, we can't, no. Oh, that's funny. It says I'm sharing. Maybe I'll stop share and reshare. Okay, so this is what I had showed. So um, Garden of Eden, Temptation, um, phones, driving, amazing donuts that have a lot of calories, another shot at the bar, but you really need to drive home. This is a modern problem we all have, um, including the mask situation. And we know that these reasons um, or these behavioral processes are driven by unique brain circuits. And so this sort of reward and limbic arousal is driven by um, more of these kind of mesolimbic circuits. There's frontal areas like the medial prefrontal cortex and the orbital frontal cortex, as well as subcortical areas um, like the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and the amygdala. These are um, sometimes called hot cognition but these are brain regions that are involved in motivation and vigilance um, and craving. There's also a mesocortical system. Um, these brain circuits tend to be um, the frontal domains are more lateral and dorsal, um, including the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, as well as the more dorsal aspects of the striatum, like the caudate and the putamen, 
and the hippocampus involved in memory. Sometimes this is called cold cognition. Um, and then sort of a third circuit that I think is actually really underappreciated in addiction medicine. Um, and I hope that we all start to focus on a little more. I'll show you some um, rationale for that, especially with pain, is the nigrostriatal system. And in this case, um, we have the motor system and the premotor system that project down to the um, basal ganglia, the thalamus, and incorporate the cerebellum. So this is my sort of simplified view of these neural circuits. Um, but just to show you, I didn't really make these up. I could show you many, many, many circuit diagram figures um, which show that there's frontal striatal connectivity. Um, and these, this frontal striatal connectivity um, can guide decision-making. In fact, so much so that in animals, um, like in rodent models and in non-human primate models, you can selectively stimulate these circuits um, using optogenetics, and you can cause an animal to press a lever more or less for drugs by changing activity in these limbic circuits. Okay, and so if we think about this kind of circuit-based framework for trying to um, push someone either, a pull someone away from a drug or just to decrease the value of the drug, we have three strategies. One strategy is to increase executive control. So in that situation where you're in the bar with a lot of friends, just increase your ability to walk away, uh, perhaps by weighing alternative consequences. Another idea is to try to just dampen down the reinforcing value of that particular stimulant. Um, so in the case of alcohol, um, it just, you know, somebody says, oh, come on, one more round. And you think, you know, I don't know, it's just not really very exciting to me. Um, we do this naturally when we're satiated. So um, when I, um, I really like cookies and I have really, really good cookies in the um, refrigerator right now. And after dinner, um, I will have a cookie and I'll look forward to that cookie. Um, but then after I have like one, even though that cookie, even though that cookie is still delicious, I've kind of gotten full. And so I don't really need another one. Um, and so by decreasing the reinforcing value of the stimulus, you can also decrease drug use. And then the other one, I, which I kind of mentioned a little is this idea of motor control. So in the addiction field, we really don't, think about the motor circuit very much. Um, but if you, um, especially if you're a clinician or a provider, you know very well that a lot of what your patients do um, is just habit, right? Smoking in particular is this way. Um, it's just a habit, it's motoric. There's an idea of the sensory motor um, involvement with the whole ritual of smoking. Um, and it becomes integrated into the fabric of daily living for that individual. Um, and so another way to sort of think about treating addiction is to look more closely at this motor circuit that's driving the drug use. So now a little bit about TMS. Um, so uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, is now widely used across the world um, as a treatment tool for depression. Um, it was the first, it was first cleared, FDA approved or cleared for use in depression um, in 2005, I think. Um, and now there's many, it was one device approved initially, and now there's many devices that are approved, which is wonderful. Um, it, I, and this is an image of TMS clinics that was provided by one particular device, um, device developer. Um, and so now if I were to have the same image for all of the different device manufacturers, the whole United States would be covered, I'm sure. Um, and certainly the whole, the world, um, there's now TMS clinics on, on almost all of the continents, right? Except for Antarctica, I guess. Um, but you know, there could always be a first. So FDA has now approved many different devices for depression. Um, there was also a recent approval for obsessive compulsive disorder um, and one for headache. Um, and then, as I mentioned last year, it would also received approval for a certain type of TMS as a treatment tool for smoking cessation. So there's really, especially in these last maybe five years, a huge momentum in expanding the indications of TMS. Um, but one thing I'd like to kind of point out, and I'll point it out now, and I'll try to remember to point it out at the end of the talk, is that TMS itself is not a monolith. So <clears throat> to say that TMS does or doesn't work um, for a given condition is like saying that pills do or do not work for a given condition. 
TMS is just kind of the delivery device. The, the intellectual property or the sort of smart stuff is actually this sort of recipe of dosing within the TMS. So just like if you have a capsule, um, the sort of smart stuff about the capsule is the molecule that's in the capsule. It's the molecule that's in the capsule. It's how that molecule is distributed um, in time, the dosing, all of these things that are in that capsule. And that's how we think about TMS delivery. TMS is just a device, um, but the smart stuff is figuring out the right recipe. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the different ingredients for that recipe in a second. So again, we're gonna talk about the framework for treating addiction development. And now I'll tell you a little bit about how TMS works before I get into the clinical um, meat. <clears throat> so what is TMS? Um, you may have seen um, it's a few years ago, it got a lot of press um, for treating addiction. Um, there was a strong group of um, individuals in Europe, that still is an excellent group of individuals using TMS for treatment of addiction in Europe. There's actually more um, indications for use in Europe than there are in the US. Um, and they were doing really um, great work with cocaine use disorder. Um, so it got a lot of press, but one of the th important things to think about, and this is true for any clinical trial, is that the sham effect is also very important. And so, um, so, so like all fields, um, there, um, I guess I'm just trying to say, if you read studies and they happen to be negative or they happen to be like, you know, thrown away, um, don't throw away the technique, right? Um, just remember that it's all about science and some science, some experiments are what better designed than others. Um, so we just have to kind of take that into account. So a little bit about the basics of TMS. If you can think back to when you were in high school or college, you may have um, taken a physics class. Um, there's this basic idea that electricity um, can become magnetism and magnetism can become electricity. These are two of the primary forces of nature, um, just like gravity, right? So gravity is a primary force, elect electrical flow is another primary force and magnetism is another primary force. And if you take electricity and you run it down a wire, you take that wire and you wind that wire in loops. Those loops of wire will generate um, a magnetic field that's perpendicular. And when you're in school, you learn this as the right hand rule. So you have electricity that's running in a wire this way. And if you were to wind the wires around like your fingers on your right hand, you generate a magnetic field that's perpendicular to the coils of the winding, right? Um, you may have thought you would never use that again, but here you go. So likewise, if you have a magnetic field and you turn it on and off and on and off, um, right? So it's, it's in the up state and the down state and an up state and the down state, you will generate a mag an electrical field that's perpendicular to the flow of the magnetism. And so in this way, electricity can create magnetism and magnetism can create electricity. We call this electromagnetic induction. Um, and this is everywhere in our lives. This is actually how your car engine works. This is why when you pull up to a red light, um, you have to kind of go over the road and a certain way and there's little sensors in the middle of the road um, that will tell when the car is over the road and the light will change to green. Um, electromagnetic induction is everywhere. Partly it's how your cell phone works. Um, and we uh, were in actually uh, people that came way before me, um, were starting to use this to develop TMS as a treatment. Um, and so the general basics, hopefully this little video will work, is that if we have um, a TMS coil, um, which I know you all have at West Virginia, West Virginia, and probably at Marshall, um, <clears throat> and you take a TMS coil, it's nothing more than wires that have been wound around in a certain configuration. Most of the modern coils are wound um, in like a figure of eight configuration. I and mean, that's just to focus the magnetic field a little bit more. Um, but if you were to take this, this is a um, video of, this is a TMS coil. This is a it's very, um, they don't usually look this thick. This is because we have a sham coil on one side of it. But if I take this coil and I bring it down close to my arm, um, what you'll see here is as um, Dawn, she's a high school student in our lab, brings the TMS coil close to my arm, you'll see my hand start to contract. And she won't even need to touch my arm. It's because you have muscles in your arm and they're innervated by, um, by nerves, which are electromagnetically sensitive. And so as Dawn brings the coil close to my arm, notice that my hand will start to move. 
So she's bringing it close. And you can see my hand start to move. I'm not sure if you can hear the audio for the clicking of that. Um, but if you could, it was really fast. It goes um, with the beat of my hand moving. And likewise, we take that same principle and we apply it to the head. So everywhere on your head, on your body is controlled in an organized way through your primary motor cortex. And so in this case, <clears throat> we have, um, for when we dose TMS, we take the TMS coil and we place it over the primary motor cortex. And when Dawn will apply a single pulse of TMS, and you can see subtly that my right, my left hand in this video will move like there. And then a second again, there. And that's because she's just applying the TMS pulse to my primary motor cortex, right? But all the neurons here will come down the cortical spinal tract, they'll cross over at the level of the spinal cord, and they'll go out to my hand. And so in this way, we can have, we use this magnetism to depolarize neurons in the cortex and cause a contraction in the end. Um, and so some basic principles of this are that the depth matters. So as you may have noticed, this is, talk is better live, where you can actually hear the video. As you may have noticed, when she came closer and closer to my arm, the contraction got stronger. And that's because as they bring the coil closer, to the biologic agent you're trying to change, um, the, the strength of the depolarization will get strong. You may ask, you know, well, well how big is that really? Um, and we're putting it over the head. So we recently had a um, National Geographic reporter come into the lab. We placed a TMS coil on her head, made her hands move, um, little dog and pony show. And she's like, wow, that's really cool. If this was, um, this was sort of a globe. Imagine that your brain is like the earth. How much of the brain are you stimulating? So is it like you're depolarizing just like a city? Or is it a continent? Or is it a whole hemisphere? So this was really exciting to us because we we're really nerdy. And so I went back to the lab and I looked at like the sort of spatial area of the globe and the spatial area of different countries. And then the spatial area of the brain and the distribution of the TMS induced electric field. And it turns out that roughly the amount of TMS um, intensity required to make your hand move um, is stimulating an area of the brain that's about the size of India. So I kind of like that. We, um, our uh, participants who are particularly um, uh, interested in the science, we'll tell them a little about this and they find that very clever. So the second principle, one is depth. So the closer you are to the target um, is important. Um, that's going to be really important for us when we talk about addiction, because a lot of our patients um, use things like alcohol. And alcohol in particular produces a lot of brain atrophy. Um, additionally, aging produces a lot of brain atrophy. And so we can only get, we're trying to do this non-invasively, we can only get to the scalp. Um, and so if we have a brain that's kind of shrunken down, we're gonna need more um, electromagnetic intensity in order to get to that brain because the brain is farther from the distance. Um, so that's gonna be really important for our participants in the addiction space. The other is the idea that um, even though TMS can only depolarize the cortex, um, and we really, when we think about addiction, we think a lot about the striatum, uh, basal ganglia, all of these like rich dopamine areas, um, they're deeper in the brain. But thankfully, um, the way the brain works is that if you sufficiently depolarize a population of neurons in the cortex, these cortical neurons, um, almost all of the cortical parameter um, areas in the prefrontal cortex will project to the caudate and the putamen. And so if we can sufficiently cause activity in this area in the cortex, we can likely change activity here in the subcortical area. And so in this way, we think about using the cortex as kind of a window into deeper brain structures. Most of what we know about TMS, we learned from motor cortex stimulation. So um, this is just sort of an image here. The TMS um, induces um, kind of depolarized cort cortical areas that are roughly about two centimeters underneath the coil, um, as well as monosynaptic striatal targets. We learned a lot of that in the motor system. And then um, we've now in the last probably 20 years, um, spent a lot of time in the prefrontal cortex. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the FDA approved target for depression. 
Um, there's now been a lot of movement towards um, possibly the medial, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex for things like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, perhaps um, other types of addiction disorders. And then our group um, and some other groups have really been focusing on the medial prefrontal cortex as a target for addiction. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why we are doing that. But then the third principle to think about um, that you might hear people talk about is frequency. And so with frequency, we um, generally, for TMS treatment for depression, um, someone comes in for 30 to 36 sessions. Um, so that means that um, approximately five days a week for about five to six weeks, participants or patients come into a clinic, they get about 20 minutes of treatment. So treatment is typically at 10 hertz, that would be 10 times per second for about 20 minutes, um, and they come back each day. And if you follow that regimen, of the individuals that respond, um, there's actually pretty good, um, pretty reliable decrease of their depression scores for six, maybe even 12 months, depending on your barrier for sort of clinical efficacy. Um, and but what we know about TMS in general, thinking using our colleagues that do preclinical research as a background, is that, that you can induce an increase in activity or a decrease in activity. And what our depression friends are doing is they're trying to increase activity in this executive control network, right? So the same network we think about in addiction, um, just the ability to walk away. In depression, one of the models, the reason they started at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was because there is an idea that um, even though naively when I approached the field, I thought, well, depression is a limbic disease. Like it's a disease of like low affect, right? Um, but, and so I would think, well, we should probably be stimulating these limbic circuits and trying to strengthen them. But in fact, when I was taught by my own mentors is that while that is true, um, another feature of depression is a loss of control. And so many patients with depression feel as though the world is coming down on them um, and that they have, no, they have no control over things. Um, I think this is something that many of us probably um, are sensitive to or more aware of in the last 18 months, right? As COVID is here, um, it's really easy to feel like the world is changing and we don't have a lot of control over it. Um, and with that comes um, a change in apathy, you know, comes, becomes apathy, becomes like dysphoria, and so the strategy for depression has been to increase activity in this executive control circuit, kind of give people a sense of agency and direction over their own lives. Well, they do that with 10 Hertz TMS because 10 Hertz should increase activity in this particular circuit, whereas one Hertz should decrease activity in a given neural circuit. And then after we had these kind of first generation um, frequencies, we started doing faster things like theta burst. I don't want to get into this too much for you, for you all, but if you had any questions, I'd be happy to um, happy to talk to you about them. But in a nutshell, theta burst simulation you could think of as like a really efficient form of TMS. So instead of stimulating for about 20 minutes, you can get similar efficacy if you stimulate at this like pattern bursting frequency for about two minutes. Um, and so people got very excited about it, and it actually. Um, intermittent theta burst was FDA cleared for use in depression based upon the idea that it had equivalent effects. Um, and so that's kind of an area a lot of people are looking at now. In the addiction space, I'm also happy to say that we now have a lot of people all over the world trying to, um, to be smart about developing evidence-based treatment protocols for depression. Um, and if you want to know kind of what the status of the field is or was a few years ago, um, you can, this is a great article um, and you can contact me if you can't get a copy of it. Um, and if this was done, I think the thing that made me the most happy about this is there's enough people now around the world doing it. We were able to get together a group of 77 individuals representing all of these different countries um, to kind of come together and form a consensus on the state of the field of brain simulation for addiction. Um, and the path forward. And the last thing I want to mention just briefly is that um, TMS um, requires, um, requires circuitry. So again, if we think of a very neuroscience-based approach to this, we have populations of neurons under the coil, and then they have, um, so they have, den they have dendrites that receive the information, they have cell bodies, and then they have axons that project to, for example, the caudate 
And then in the caudate, there's another population of neurons. And if if the information comes down the action potential in a um, sufficient manner, it may depolarize the next group of neurons down. But what's required in this model is that you have really good intact axons. These axons are wrapped with myelin, um, which kind of serves as an insulator and helps the conduction of, um, of electric potentials down the axon. And so if you have a demyelinating disease, or if you happen to be using drugs that happen to compromise the integrity of the myelin, maybe it's in either an inflammatory process or an atrophy type process, um, we may not get as much good signal propagation to these deeper brain structures. So this is another thing we should think about when designing smart TMS protocols for varying populations with substance use disorders. Okay, as I mentioned, August 2020, the um, FDA cleared um, a particular TMS device for use in treating smoking cessation. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the data in a second. Um, the group of authors just published their um, manuscript in World Psychiatry maybe last month. Um, so you can go there if you'd like to see it. Um, and um, but what they demonstrated, and I kind of pulled this from their website, is that um, in the case, they had um, 262 chronic smokers. Um, they had 14 sites, was a double-blind sham-controlled study, and everyone received 15 sessions of active or sham TMS. So they came in five days a week for three weeks. And then they had follow-ups after that. The use of a particular type of TMS coil is one of these H coils, um, which its windings are just um, kind of made in a certain configuration such that it can stimulate both the left and the right prefrontal cortex. Um, and the way that the coil is configured, it can penetrate a bit deeper than the standard TMS coil, flat coil configurations. And so, um, and so the, sometimes this is called the insula coil, um, but in fact, it's probably more proper to just call it like an inferior prefrontal cortex coil that happens to reach the anterior insula. Um, now, the reason that um, it's smart that the people that designed this decided to go after the insula is that in 2005, I think, um, Bikara and colleagues in, um, demonstrated that individuals who, who had a stroke to the insula um, spontaneously lost the urge to smoke cigarettes at a greater rate than individuals that um, didn't have had a stroke somewhere else. And so this really put the insula on the map as a brain stimulation treatment target. And so this, um, this group demonstrated that um, in the gray bars here on this slide are the individuals that receive sham TMS. The green bars represent individuals that receive real TMS. And so the individuals that receive real TMS um, were significantly more likely um, to have quit at four weeks. Um, this is total abstinence. And that's true in both the intent to treat group, which are the people that initiated any treatment, and the individuals that treat that completed it as, um, as prescribed, essentially. Um, and this is another graph which shows sort of compatible stuff. So this, in some ways, this is really great. Um, it's certainly a huge opportunity and opening for the field of brain stimulation-based therapeutics and addiction. Um, but one of the challenges here is that if you look at the numbers, um, so the best data is the difference between completers, um, sham and real. And the individuals that receive real TMS, 28% um, quit smoking for four weeks. They had to come in every day for three weeks. So um, in some ways, it's good in that it's significantly better than sham, but it's got a lot of patient burden, right? Um, so if you have, so let's call that 30%, so that'll be three in 10 people. So that means you had 10 people come into the lab um, five days a week for three weeks, and you look to see if they're not smoking at the end of four weeks. Well, Three of them quit smoking. But that also means that seven of them didn't quit smoking. Now, the efficacy there is actually comparable to medication. Um, and so in some ways, it, um, it's perfectly right for it to, I mean, it's as good as anything else. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people, and especially in rural health communities, that don't have access to um, a TMS treatment center readily, at least at this moment in time. Um, that's kind of another topic at what I'd be happy to talk about in the um, question session is how we're going to make TMS more scalable to rural communities. It's kind of a really cool idea. Um, 
So there's definitely room for improvement um, because the sort of patient burden in this case is really high um, and the efficacy for all of the treatments available for depression really, or for smoking, really isn't that great yet. So we come back to these three different strategies, increasing executive control, decreasing the rewarding value of the stimulus or motor. Our group has focused a lot on medial prefrontal cortex stimulation. So that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, talk to you about in the last section of this talk. Um, and so what we've done a lot of um, is over time kind of trying to evaluate if this medial prefrontal target was even like a feasible target. There's a lot of reasons anatomically it, we thought it might not work as a reason from like a um, skin sensation perspective. People thought it wouldn't work. Um, so we've done a lot of like basic neuroscience steps to eventually get to a clinical trial. And I'm just going to go through these real quickly with you um, in the next few slides, um, but just kind of give you an idea of how we have approached developing a SMART protocol. Um, my hope is that other people also kind of do some of this basic science work in order to develop a SMART TMS protocol. Because right now, honestly, the field just kind of like people just jump into clinical trials. And if you've ever tried to run a clinical trial, and it is a lot of work and it's slow and it's not very flexible. And so you need to be really sure that what you, the protocol you're gonna put into that trial is really what you wanna do um, because it's a lot of effort, time and money. Um, so it's smart to really spend a little extra time on the front end to design a patient tailored um, protocol. And so the first thing we figured out was that we wanted to stimulate the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, because no one was doing it. And a lot of our um, preclinical friends showed that with optogenetics, you can, um, you can in fact influence a causal effect on drug self-administration by stimulating the medial prefrontal cortex. So once we figured out that that's what we wanted to stimulate, we needed to figure out if by using a um, TMS in the MRI scanner, if in fact we apply a single pulse of TMS to the medial prefrontal cortex, does it change the shrinum? And then once we figured out that, we tried to sort of see if we could differentiate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex from the medial prefrontal cortex. We then tried it in um, individuals with alcohol use disorder and cocaine use disorder to see if we could push and pull those circuits. Um, and then finally, we moved to sort of our early stage clinical trials, um, which I'll show you about in just a second. And our kind of feature direction is um, like in all of science, the more you learn, you realize the less you understand. Um, and so it has become very apparent to me that there's so much individual variability, both in architecture and, and brain architecture and brain function, and of course, behavior, um, that we really um, probably, it's not going to be a one size fits all TMS treatment protocol for everyone that comes into the clinic. So as I mentioned, we chose the medial prefrontal cortex in part because our friends doing uh, rodent research demonstrated that using optogenetics, if you apply certain frequencies of light to the infralimbic or prelimbic cortex, you can induce a causal change in um, rodents pressing a lever for cocaine use for, for cocaine. Um, and that was also shown a little bit with alcohol. So then we also took um, imaging data from a large group of the individuals that had come through our lab. So in this case, we had 156 individuals that had um, come into the lab, we put them in an MRI scanner, we showed them pictures of their drug of choice, um, as well as a uh, neutral stimulus. So if they were cocaine users, we showed them pictures of crack cocaine. Uh, if, if they were crack, they would watch crack. If they were alcohol users, we showed them their preferred type of alcoholic beverage. And if you look across all of these groups, the in, um, in general, it's the medial prefrontal cortex and the anterior insula that really show this kind of transdiagnostic activation for drugs. If you break these data down into the individual type of drug, um, we find that actually alcohol users and nicotine users have really strong Q evoked brain activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, the cocaine users have kind of this distributed network which includes the medial prefrontal cortex, but also the anterior insula. Um, and so we tried to figure out where exactly we wanted to target. Um, unfortunately, if you happen to come across this literature, you'll see that we and myself as included are all a little bit sloppy with the words that we use. Um, there are now many of us trying to 
um, explore the medial wall. So all the way from here, which we would call ventral medial prefrontal cortex, but you could also call orbital frontal cortex, the sort of here, which you would call dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and further back. But so this area here, for example, um, is probably on me is like my SMA, which is the supplementary motor area. Um, but sometimes this is also called the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. So just to be clear, um, I'm not trying to give you a neuroscience lesson here, but just to be clear, um, we really are simulating kind of the medial prefrontal cortex frontal pole right around here. Um, so what we did is we took individuals that with cocaine use disorder and alcohol use disorder, and we used this um, TMS sandwich design, I like to call it. So people came into the lab, we showed them images of their drug of choice, which is a neutral um, condition, and they went into the scanner, we gave them a session of real or a session of sham TMS, and then they put, we put them right back in the scanner and we showed them pictures again. So we compared the effects of real versus sham TMS on brain reactivity to drug cues pre and post intervention. Um, another important thing about TMS um, in a therapeutic context is more and more people are um, showing cues. In fact, the FDA um, labels for OCD and smoking cessation both require that the patient um, is exposed to some type of cue induction um, during the treatment itself. And in our case, this is like a whole other discussion, but in our case, we chose to, um, our strategy was to dampen activity in the limbic network. And so we wanted people to recall um, what it felt like, um, what the experience was like um, when they were using the drug, such that that memory was kind of awake and alive in their brain, hopefully malleable. Um, and then such that we would stimulate with TMS and the reconsolidation of that memory would be disrupted. Um, and in this case, we used, um, relied on a colleague's um, influence that's doing exposure therapy for PTSD. So we used some exposure therapy based scripts in order to um, induce the cue, um, the cue memory. And what we found was that at baseline, um, both in 25 cocaine users and 24 alcohol users, at baseline, um, individuals had very strong brain reactivity to these drug cues between the medial prefrontal cortex and the putamen. Um, you can see that cocaine users are in the figure A and the alcohol users are in figure B. And in both cases, the functional connectivity, and what that means is if you have many brain regions, you look at um, something called the bold signal, the bold signal in region one is highly um, correlated with the bold signal in region two. And so the assumption we all make is that these regions are then acting together. Um, and they're sort of an, uh, sort of, I guess, posit in neuroscience that things that are um, fired together, wired together. And so this idea that these areas really are working in synchrony and they're very strong when, we're, when looking at drug cues. But then after real versus sham TMS, there was a selective reduction in functional connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and the striatum regions. Um, as you can see here, we did actually have some really nice consistency in the medial prefrontal cortex to the putamen, which is actually the dorsal striatum, um, in both the alcohol users and the cocaine users. This was published in um, Biological Psychiatry a few years ago. Um, and really, I think, is one of the things that, um, that I'm probably most proud of, because what I, um, as scientists, we all wonder sometimes, like, if we're, you know, if we're actually teaching the field anything, because it's so complicated and we do more things that fail than the things that work. Um, and we talk about the things that work a lot more than the things that fail. Um, but what I thought was so great about this is that these data sets were analyzed independently. Um, and there was a common thing that happened in both the cocaine users and the alcohol users with this particular intervention. And so I really think what we have here is a TMS protocol that has transdiagnostic efficacy in reducing brain reactivity to cues. But as I mentioned with depression treatment, um, you really need to have multiple sessions in order to have a lasting durable effect. Um, and in fact, our friends that do depression research have really made great strides in um, some dosing and figuring out the minimal number of sessions that are needed in order to have a durable effect. Um, and just, just kind of keep that brief, that discussion brief. It seems like 30 is maybe like a little bit of a magic number. So um, in addiction world, um, you know, 30 is a really big investment of time, actually. And there's a reason to believe that maybe if we had more efficient protocols like theta burst stimulation, 
and maybe we could do multiple sessions in a day, that we could shrink that down. Um, and so we don't need 30, maybe we need 15, or maybe we only need 10 days. Um, you, you may have seen um, in the news or Twitter or wherever you get your science news, um, the a very influential paper probably came out in American Journal of Psychiatry last week um, <clears throat> with this very high um, dosing strategy of TMS for depression. Um, the group in Stanford, um, Nolan Williams and crew, um, did this really um, very, uh, very cutting edge protocol where they took people with um, suicidality and depression that were inpatients. They um, gave them 10 sessions of TMS per day for three days. Um, and they demonstrated that the individuals got real TMS versus those that got sham TMS um, did better when they left the hospital. Um, so that's this really high density TMS, um, which we hope that we can kind of decrease it from 30 sessions. So in our case, because we were just sort of starting out, we used um, 10 days or 10 sessions of a really high um, frequency type of TMS. We used 3,600 pulses of something called continuous theta burst stimulation, which is delivered to the medial prefrontal cortex. This was done for people that came into an intensive outpatient treatment program for addiction. So we, um, it was wonderful. We um, had this IOP program um, associated with us and we kind of partnered with the IOP program and people that came in for their orientation visits in the IOP, um, we introduced them to the study, asked them if they were interested, individuals that were interested. Um, in our case, we gave them an MRI scan to look at their brain reactivity at baseline, as well as a number of assessments behaviorally. And then they were in the IOP program. And each morning, um, individuals that were enrolled in our study got a session of real or sham TMS before their IOP program um, teaching, essentially. Um, and that was done for the length of the IOP program. Um, so it took most people about four weeks to get through the 10 days. It was about two to three sessions per, two to three days per week of the TMS. Um, and then at the end, um, we gave them another MRI scan to look at their brain reactivity to cues. We did a one month and a two month follow-up. In all cases, we, were, we took an MRI scan. And what we found in this case, we did uh, alcohol users, and this is a consort diagram from that study. Um, 50 individuals were randomized. Um, and in the end, to just kind of draw your attention to the bottom, we had um, 10 individuals, we had about two times as many people remain enrolled that were in, randomized, to the, um, randomized to the real TMS group. Um, and in fact, most people completed it. You can see the 84% in both groups stayed enrolled for the duration of the study. Um, these were kind of the general demographics of the study here. Um, this um, manuscript is currently under review. Um, I am hope hopeful it will get published soon, and then I can um, direct you to a link for this. And if we just look at the brain reactivity here, um, <clears throat> individuals that receive sham TMS, it, after the IOP program, we look at the change in the brain reactivity to cues, um, there was no difference. But then one month after they left IOP, they had a strong brain reactivity to alcohol cues. Two months after they left IOP, which is, I'm sorry, this is our three month time point, um, they also had strong brain reactivity to cues. Individuals that receive real TMS, they also didn't have much change after IOP. And I actually think this is because the IOP was very good. And so the IOP itself, um, had some effect for them, right? But once they leave the IOP um, at the one and two month follow-ups, which here are the two and three month time points of the study, um, the individuals that receive real TMS had a sustained decrease in functional connectivity between the um, medial prefrontal cortex, which is called FP1 in this situation, and the dorsal and ventral striatum, which is, can be considered the um, caudate and putamen dorsally and ventrally. So this was really, um, we, we, I think this is really exciting data. This is sort of a logical extension of that sandwich design study that I showed you. And this shows that if you give 10 sessions of TMS, you really can decrease brain reactivity to cues for up to two months after the completion of the study itself. Um, we did a similar study in the cocaine users. In this case, it was done in a VA. Um, and I think you all are affiliated with a VA. Um, the VA has very unique um, substance use treatment programs. In fact, their RVA, um, the Ralph Johnson VA, this was done in Charleston, um, is, has a fantastic substance use treatment program. Um, but it's hard to do research there because their substance use treatment program is so good. 
um, people really don't relapse very much. And this is in part because their housing is dependent upon staying clean. Um, and so we didn't really have very many people relapse in the study, but we could see a change in brain reactivity over time. Um, and in this case, just to kind of show you, um, if we look at the sobriety, so this is um, this is sobriety to, to cocaine use, this is actually self-report um, verified secondarily with urines. Um, individuals that um, received real TMS um, were almost two times as likely to be sober, um, not having used cocaine one month after completion of the IOP. Um, and if we look again at the changes in brain reactivity over time, alcohol users have this very um, consistent pattern. And so they, the change that TMS made was in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is exactly the same brain region that we're stimulating. So that story is very tight, actually. Um, the cocaine users, the change that they had, again, was really distributed. And you may see this was a theme I've actually talked about way earlier in the talk, the cocaine users had this much wider distribution of brain structures that was evoked by Q. And so that might suggest that in cocaine users, we should think about a different strategy. Maybe medial prefrontal cortex um, is not sufficient, um, or maybe we need to consider variability um, in them as kind of an um, important treatment target. And so the punchline here is that um, stimulating the medial prefrontal cortex um, is feasible. Um, people stay enrolled. Um, and we have now done, um, this is actually an old slide, we've now done many more people than this um, by stimulating the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, our colleagues at um, Pittsburgh, Rebecca Price and colleagues, um, they have recently done a study of frontal pole or medial prefrontal cortex stimulation for obsessive compulsive disorder, published in American Journal of Psychiatry, also showing that stimulating the frontal pole may be um, a useful treatment target for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so this is kind of an emerging treatment target, um, feasible and well tolerated. One of the barriers to um, stimulating the medial prefrontal cortex, even though we know it's so important in the addiction process and any, any behavioral syndrome associated with too much limbic drive to a certain stimulus um, or cue arousal, um, potentially PTSD would fall into this um, category. Um, is that practitioners kind of thought it would be really painful. Um, and in fact, it, um, we ran, we, you can just use a slow ramping procedure. Um, and so we have no problem at all with the painfulness. In fact, we recently um, published a study where we had 407 data from 407 people that had come into the lab for varying studies. They had received TMS to either the medial prefrontal cortex or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, we, they rated their painfulness, the perceived painfulness of the TMS to the DLPFC versus the MPFC. Um, and as you can see here, this is an um, average pain rating by brain region. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is on the left, um, the motor cortex is in the middle, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is on the right. And so the dorsolateral and ventral medial prefrontal cortex really are very similar. They're not significantly different. Um, but maybe the VMPFC is a little bit more painful. Um, and there are certain strategies that can be used to attenuate the sensation on the skin. Um, this includes um, a slow ramping of the TMS protocols. Um, unfortunately, the, some of the devices um, don't allow us to ramp as nice as we'd like to, but we're um, hoping to talk to more of the manufacturers to make that more of a reasonable thing, because I think that's going to be very important um, as we move forward to sort of um, enable us to really have um, the ability to generalize this TMS targeting to many sites in the brain, which is clearly the way the field is gonna move as we move more towards patient tailored treatment targeting. Um, okay, and so this is kind of all the stuff I told you. I know it was a whirlwind of data. Um, and so I just wanna kind of finish with a little about how we're sort of tailoring the treatment to our individual patients on a slide or two about pain. So one of the big things as I mentioned earlier is that TMS will only penetrate a certain depth. Um, and so if you, um, you have to increase the intensity of the stimulation in order to get deeper in the brain. And so because we talked about the forehead as a brain region that um, actually is already a little bit more sensitive than let's say the motor cortex, that's due, that is clearly due in part to your hand, to your hair, um, but it's also just due to the somatotopic mapping of your surface of your body on your brain. Um, the medial prefrontal cortex also is a little bit tough because we have these frontal sinuses in our brain. You can see here on this image, on um, the sagittal section, 
kind of just below where it says 11 millimeters. Um, here in this um, gentleman, I think, um, you can see this prominent frontal sinus. And so in this case, if we're gonna place the TMS coil, um, and we wanna get it close to the scalp, we kind of have to go above their brow ridge. Um, and so that's gonna be allowed 11 centimeters. Um, and so we have to think a little bit more about sort of the neural architecture or to do something called electric field modeling in order to really figure out the dose of the TMS that we're delivering to the cortex. Um, and here, sorry, I'll go through this quickly. This is just a um, graduate student in my lab, Dan McCallie, has done some really great work measuring the average scalp to cortex distance in alcohol users and healthy controls of these various targets. And in fact, he has found that in general, there's not a systemic difference, um, which is really good news and would suggest that we don't have to take this into account as much as we may have thought based upon the basic neuroscience. Um, we do see that there's, um, there's, however, a lot of white matter loss in these alcohol users, um, which would make, make the idea that t for in order for TMS to get to the subcortical areas in an efficient manner, um, we might need to deliver more to the prefrontal cortex in order to enable the signal to propagate. And then finally, um, you know, addiction is of course a spectrum, right? So the reasons that you use drugs when you're young um, become very different than the reasons you use drugs when you're older. Um, and I know you guys in the audience are probably more experts at this than I am, so I don't need to preach to the choir. But if we're gonna be smart about picking an addiction treatment, just like you might um, change the type of medication regimen or the type of behavioral therapy you would for a patient based upon their drug use history, we should also, of course, take that into account when developing a brain stimulation therapy. Um, the individual that has just started binging on a drug and they're kind of young and they just can't get over that sort of two reactivity part, maybe they need a little TMS in the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, but maybe the person that smokes just because it's a habit or drinks because it's a habit and it's just a part of their daily routine, maybe we need to think more about motor circuitry or the supplementary motor areas as treatment targets to try to break that cycle or that habit of drug use. Um, <clears throat> and then just the last few seconds, I wanna talk a little bit about pain. Um, so of course, um, you all know, um, or that some of you all are like the experts in this field, might have even contributed to this particular um, graphic, um, is that the opiate epidemic is everywhere. And one of the biggest reasons for non-medical use of prescription opiates is chronic pain. Um, so currently in the field of TMS, um, there are two targets that have really been focused, the focus of most um, uh, TMS for pain studies. One of them is the motor cortex. Um, and the other one is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the motor cortex, um, there's now actually the most data for the motor cortex. So if you're an addiction person, you might think to yourself, motor control, that's weird, I don't know. Um, but in fact, what we know is, um, so surgically, surgeons can kind of go in and they can place elect stimulating electrodes on a portion of the motor or sensory motor cortices um, that have a painful, sensation. This is done, for example, in patients with phantom limb pain. They can, um, if you have phantom limb pain and you place um, an electrode over the somatotopic area of the brain that's involved with, let's say, that missing finger, um, you can actually dampen the pain sensation and make it go away. And so what we know from that is that, in fact, stimulating the sensory motor cortex can actually attenuate a pain, a pain syndrome, a chronic pain syndrome. Um, so, so that's an idea. And in fact, a few years ago, probably like five or six years ago now, um, a European commission came out and they said that there's actually class A evidence of TMS for two things. One is depression and the other is pain. And so even though TMS um, doesn't have FDA approval for treating pain in the United States, um, I actually think that's honestly just, just because nobody has tried. Um, no drug, no device company has sponsored a big clinical trial for pain. Um, but there's plenty of um, evidence out there that suggests that it could work. The other option um, is that um, we could try to increase executive control. So just like depression, there's this idea that you can have some cognitive control, in this case, over the pain stimulation. Um, and some um, great work has been done with delivering TMS in the post-operative recovery room, demonstrating that patients will push less, um, push a PCA um, pump for morphine less, um, if they've been given um, a single session of 10 hertz TMS in the post-operative recovery room. 
Um, and this effect seems to be blocked by naloxone. So um, if you take that same sort of experimental paradigm and you give individuals naloxone, you can block the anti-nociceptive effects, suggesting that the analgesic effects of TMS are opiate mediated. And so if we think about that um, together, and then we think, well, you know, we might be able then to use TMS if TMS is inducing some sort of um, analgesic effect, and that an analgesic effect can be blocked by an opiate blocker, then perhaps we could use TMS as a tool to help promote opiate sparing, or perhaps to bring people down off of opiate. Um, and so, uh, but in order to move forward with that, and there are actually a few small studies that have been, um, and maybe a big clinical trial is going on to evaluate that, um, we need to kind of figure out where we should stimulate. And so we did a um, small study in our lab, because um, as you may understand, I kind of really like to work on this basic science portion before we kind of move forward with a big, expensive, slow clinical trial. Um, we had motor cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. TMS was given to um, 22 individuals that had chronic pain and opiate use disorder. And these individuals received um, 10 sessions of TMS to either the motor cortex or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And you can see here on, these, um, on this work here, in, I, to much to my surprise, I really, I would have bet that the DLPFC was gonna be more effective. Um, for pain in opiate users because of the addiction link. Um, much to my surprise, the motor cortex um, had a larger effect on both pain interference, so how much pain interfered with their activities of daily living, as well as their urge to use opiates. I mean, this was really astounding, actually. And so um, 10 hertz TMS delivered to the motor cortex just below um, their thresholds, so 90% of the motor threshold really attenuated um, opiate urges um, in these individuals. So this is really a great start. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I've actually had really hard um, time getting funding for opiate, for TMS and um, pain research. So, um, so much so that like, hmm, it's hard to kind of keep going back to the well, but I would like to pass this off to so many others that might be interested in this space, and especially you guys there, um, opiate use is such a problem, and I'm sure chronic pain is also a problem. Um, anything you all, anything we can do as a community to help promote opiate sparing with a technique like TMS, which is non-invasive, um, would be wonderful. Um, but I kind of think we're going to have to work together um, to come up with creative solutions for sort of funding um, in this particular population and this space. And that's all I wanted to show. Um, of course, like all scientists, you know, I get to be the one, the ambassador, to tell you all about it. But it's you know, all of these other people in my lab um, here and in the past um, that have really done all the hard work. So I'd be remiss to not um, thank them. So thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. All right, great. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, so I'm sure Dr. Hanlon would be happy to take any questions um, from the audience. Um, you can post those questions to the chat uh, function. Uh, it looks like we already have a question, so I'll go ahead and, and read that. Uh, so the question is, do you have ideas on what ongoing care after TMS treatment uh, would be involved? Specifically, after this treatment is applied, do you think there would, there would need to be ongoing non-TMS support provided to people in order to, to sustain desired outcome improvements? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, so I think to say that TMS is going to like cure any type of addiction is obviously short-sighted, right? Addiction is very complicated. And, and, you know, and addiction itself is a you know, wide variety of people. So what I view in the landscape is that, um, is that addiction will just, that TMS will just be a piece of addiction treatment. And I think it probably really needs to ride on top of behavioral therapy for some type of addiction. Um, and so, I mean, to be discreet, the treatment for depression um, does not require any aftercare. So people get 30 sessions of TMS and then they remain and they, they're not necessarily in um, therapy. Many of them will be prescribed SSRIs and other type of pharmacotherapeutics, but in general, they will remain, individuals that respond will remain undepressed for several months without the need for something called TMS booster shots. So there's this also idea kind of in the field that maybe we need a little bit of like a booster shot every so often. 
kind of like working out with the vaccines recently, right? Um, so, I, but per, my personal bias, if you're asking for my opinion, is that um, TMS should not be considered like a single treatment for addiction. That to treat somebody with alcohol use disorder, um, they might need a little bit of TMS to a brain circuit that's involved, a little bit of pharmacotherapeutic modulation of the rest of their brain, and then a little bit of ongoing counseling to make sure they stay on track. Okay. So I actually had a, a similar question. So, so in terms of, you know, thinking about TMS uh, being done in conjunction with medical assisted therapies, whether it's for depression or substance abuse, um, it, it, is there evidence that those effects are, you know, additive in terms of the therapeutic benefits? Like what work has been done in that, in that arena? Yeah, so it's a great question. So, um, so you mean like if you did TMS alone and you did medication assisted therapy alone and then you did TMS and MAT. Um, so I don't, I don't think that study has been done, um, but it would be a great one. Um, we kind of have a small window to do that, right? Because at some point, MAT will just become standard of care, and then you won't be able to have a group that doesn't get MAT. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I, um, to date, um, I, I could be missing a few recent articles, but to date, I don't think anybody has done that study. It's hard, it's hard to imagine that it won't synergize. Yeah, that's my sense. All right, do other audience members have questions? I, I can ask more um, <laughs> if, if you don't, but. All right, I don't see any other questions right now, uh, so I'll, I'll ask another one. Um, so, so, so there's been a lot of work recently in the addiction field in terms of the, the lateral venula um, and the fact that it's involved in mediating um, unpleasant or aversive effects of, of drugs of abuse. Um, so thinking about how TMS would work I'm guessing it's too deep in order to stimulate, or is that something that's been done or? Yeah, you know, it's funny, right? So the, um, I would, uh, in brain imaging world, we don't talk about the abenula very much, but I think you, I don't think there's a reason you can't get to the abenula. Um, yeah, so I think it hasn't really been worked out, but I do think, but but that being said, right, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the preclinical work that really suggests it's like super important, especially for this, right, aversive kind of like tuning maybe of the um, of the valence of a certain stimuli, which really would set it up as a great brain stimulation treatment for it. Um, I think it's, we haven't really just moved there yet. And I think it's because we speak different languages. I think the like habenula doesn't really come up in fMRI papers very much. Um, but if we kind of like, work together and we, uh, I think it certainly could happen. Yeah. And, and I would guess that some of the, the, the effects that you're having in terms of stimulating the prefrontal cortex, that that would impact activity of the habenula downstream. Yeah. Like this. So, Where does that, what are the projecting regions to the habenula? So I'd have to look it up real quick. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know which specific nuclei of the prefrontal cortex yeah. just from, from, mm -hmm. from um, so it does look like we have a couple more questions. Um, so the first question is, what are the relative advantages of TMS over T TDCS? Good question. Um, I don't know if you have somebody talking about TDCS today, but so TDCS is um, also a non-invasive brain stimulation technique, um, but it doesn't, it has a really different mechanism of action. So I showed you with TMS, you can like give a pulse, and your hand will move. And that's because TMS has this really quick on and off and it can depolarize axon. So most importantly, TMS can cause brain regions to fire. TDCS um, doesn't do that. You can't, um, you really, can't, with my current TDCS methods, you can't get your hand to move ever. Um, so TDCS works, we think by changing, um, kind of like the back, like changing the gain on the brain. So the background neurons, like, so it's called, it's a neuromodulation technique and in probably strict definition is probably more of a modulator. So just like a weak stimulant, like cocaine will make you like a little more up. So we think TDCS does is it, it raises the resting membrane potential of the areas that the um, activity hits. So from a real world treatment perspective, TDCS is um, used a lot to, for things like trying to enhance 
um, physical therapy or enhance recovery of motor function. So you can kind of like line the brain up a little bit and enable it to kind of act more easily. Some people have been using it for um, in the addiction space. Um, and it, you might imagine it could be useful for um, as a pair with something like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so if you could do some type of cognitive behavioral therapy and everybody had a TDCS cap on, maybe they would sort of absorb the effects of the CBT better because they were kind of paying more attention or more alert or their brain was sort of more engaged. Um, so it's, a, it's just a different technique. Um, TDCS hasn't been FDA cleared or approved for any medical use yet, um, but it is actually approved in various forms as a consumer product. Um, so it is available. Okay, and it looks like we have another question. Um, so have these treatments been used in treating things like overeating or sugar addiction? Yeah, it's a great question. There have been, um, I think that I think that area is really very interesting. Um, there's a growing body of work. They tend to stimulate the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, but to my knowledge, there hasn't yet been a big, um, a big clinical trial to look at it. Um, so there's been a lot of small trials that have shown, um, <clears throat> we actually did a study of medial prefrontal cortex stimulation, um, which I haven't, we haven't published yet, but we, we were able to show that five days of intensive um, TMS to the medial prefrontal cortex can decrease the desire um, and ad lib eating for um, high fat foods in individuals that were obese. Other people have looked at um, 10 hertz TMS to the left dorsolateral prefrontal. So it's still early. Um, like many things, it's going to need, um, we need money in order to pursue it. Um, but I think it's really a good, um, it, certainly good option. Okay. Um, I guess what, what, there are no further questions um, that I'd like to thank Dr. Hanlon um, and, and please join me in, in, in thanking her for a really great presentation. So, so thank you so much. So I think at this point, we'll take a um, 30 minute break and reconvene at uh, 10 o'clock central, 11 o'clock um, Eastern time uh, for our, our virtual poster sessions. So thank you so much, everybody.